Em Rossiano and Michael Lucas. I've just been sitting there in the corner clutching my little anxiety blanket. This is Em Salation. I'm Michael, I'm from the suburbs, I can't play sport, and would anyone like to watch Aladdin on VHS? <laughs> Could I have birthed them? No? Feel free to perv. I mean, your genes are very strong. <laughs> very you. strong. I can't believe my genes aren't in there going, Scott, yeah! You're in M Salation. Am I putting a googie egg up my juts? <laughs> hello, hello, welcome. How are you? Look, um, it's been a big response to last Thursday's podcast. How are you lost, baby girl? And I want to thank you for the deep investment that you all put in. <laughs> I received so many messages. But first, look, I just want to say thank you, of course, for choosing us. There is a bajillion podcasts out there. Every man and his dog has one now. And whether you're listening to me in your ears or maybe you're in your car or maybe I'm on your Bluetooth speaker at home, thank you. I really mean it. Um, Before we get to last week's episode and uh, 365 Dinny, I want to give you a total exclusive, all right, at least at the time of recording. So obviously businesses are starting to go back to normal, but us live performers, (laughs) there's no real end in sight for when we're going to be able to do our jobs again. So I'm going to put on a live show that you can watch in your lounge room. Yes. Yes. I've hired a small studio space. I've got a crew. And on Friday night, June 26th, I'm going to be streaming into your house with a little live show. Now, it's going to cost you 10 bucks. And it's the only way you can watch it is buying a ticket. We're doing it through a special platform. And it will not be available for free because mama's got to eat, um, which is the same as a live show when you think about it. You can't come to a venue and watch me on stage if you don't have a ticket. So we're going to run it like that. But unlike a live show, if you can't make it on the 26th, you can buy a ticket and watch it at a later time. So that's pretty cool. Um, it's going to be great, though, if you can watch me live because we're going to be having interactions. I'll be answering questions. You can comment. My dad's going to be there. Olivia and Peron are going to be there. And look, I know a few people will probably come at me for putting this show behind a paywall, but look, I put out a lot of things, so much, some would argue too much into the world for free, and this is my job. So I really hope you can all come. Um, I'm just trying to figure out a way to keep working, even though you and I can't be in the same room. So all the details will be up at mrussiano.com this week, and I'm just, I'm pretty pumped to be able to put on a live show again. And don't worry, I'm going to be dressing up. You can set a theme, you can invite people over, but, you know, don't have 100 people at your house and only buy one ticket. That would be pretty tight. I mean, how how am I even going to know? (laughs) So mrussiano.com if you would um, like to come along in your lounge room. Well, let's regroup. 365 Dinny. We trended on Netflix. I'm taking full responsibility. And I have to say, I woke up Sunday morning to hundreds of messages from you guys who clearly waited until Saturday night to watch. And, oh, God, I was laughing so much. And a lot of you felt ripped off by the ending of the movie. And I didn't want to warn you about it because it's so bonkers. it, it It feels like it's two different movies, doesn't it? The first half and the second half. And I really wanted you to discover the ending for yourself. So um, if you haven't watched it yet, it, it, please do and um, then listen to our podcast from last Thursday. And then a lot of you felt like you didn't need to watch the movie after it, which is, was on my daughter. She said, I don't need to watch it now. I've heard all of that. My favourite comment came from Gillian Rose, who sent me a message. What did I just watch? I have so many questions. This must have started as Twilight fan fiction. Oh, my God. What? that, that It could. You know I'm obsessed with Twilight. Massimo is Edward wanting to be more human kind for Laura, who's Bella. <gasps> the second movie will have her fall for his rival and then kidnapped what, from the tunnel. Olga is obviously Rosalie. Gillian, I appreciate how deep you went on this. I love that you put so much thought into it. So um, look, only movie, movies like this only come along every so often, little gems, little jewels. And a few people have asked that Michael and I do a live recapping of Showgirls, which is something I will think about. <laughs> But I'll keep my eyes and ears peeled for the next 365 Dinny. I'm sure there are more movies coming. There's a lot of interesting content coming out of lockdown, obviously. And I do wonder if a lot of your partners got lucky on Saturday night after you watched it. Because even though intellectually you know it's ridiculous, no one tells you vagina that, do they? No one, t- no one tells you. No one tells you a little sex drive when you're like feeling a little bit of, oh, I wouldn't mind a little bit of. I mean, and I'm not saying you pretended your partner was Massimo, but I'm not not saying that either. Okay. Well, 
It's time to move on. Michael Lucas will be joining us next. And um, he and I have been doing a lot of soul searching on some of the movies we loved as a kid that we now realise are a little bit problematic. And Scotty Barrow is here because it's uh, Tuesday app to help one of you guys. Um, and, and if you want Scotty to help you, send an email to hello at mrussiano.com. Just a little 30-second recording of you and the thing you'd like Scotty to assist you with. All right, let's move on. M. Rossiano and Michael Lucas. This is M. Salation. Well, I haven't actually told him, but, I mean, Michael, the response to last week's podcast has been, I mean, I've never experienced anything like it. <laughs> Do you mean people furious at us for bringing such unmitigated trash <laughs> into their lives? No, people well- <laughs> wanting to sue us for the 90 minutes that they spent <laughs> sentenced in that movie? No, it was just extra. So we're talking about last Thursday we um, pop, the podcast came out, uh, uh, Are Your Last Baby Girl, and um, basically us reviewing a live review of the movie 365 Disney Days. Uh, and that movie, since the podcast came out, is now trending number one on Netflix, which I am taking full responsibility for. <laughs> I'm pretty sure about 50,000 of our listeners waited till Saturday night to watch it, Michael, because, oh, my God, some of the responses. But thank you, everyone. It's our most listened to podcast so far, I think, and um, I just – Jesus. Who up. would have thought that <laughs> unbridled sex – would get your clicks. <laughs> I just feel like there was a lot of a lot of partners were pounced upon on Saturday night and they didn't know why. And you know what? They have us to thank. I keep following his Instagram account. Oh. I mean, I'd be lo- I'd love to see how his stats went up in, in Australia. <laughs> it's like women, 18 to 50 in Australia. What is going on there? But also, I mean, t- he really delivers what you oh. expect. Like it's just him sort of squinting sultrily at the camera in the sunlight and then cut to he's playing a concerto. <laughs> he's just oh, love- We're talking about Michele um, Marone who plays Massimo. Um, I just love how sometimes he puts a live stream on and he doesn't even bless us with his presence until about – I don't know, three minutes in. He knows we'll we just, hang in. We just watch his weird artwork in the background and then he sits down and he's smoking and normally I'm like, nope, that's not good. But his smoking, it wouldn't be cancerous. Like I just don't, I just don't think he could get <laughs> cancer. I just, and I sat there and I watched him smoke while he talked about all the languages he doesn't speak, and it was terrible content. But I didn't care. He has actually managed to create Stockholm syndrome just purely with an <laughs> Instagram account. We're trapped. We can't look away, even though we do have free will. We just don't believe it. There's a bunch of women and gay men wandering the streets fully dressed, just waiting for him to kidnap them. <laughs> just looking around corners, just hoping to hear, Are you lost, baby girl? And you are right. He does. He looks weirdly ageless. Like, there's no way you would think he's 29. Right. I think he's basically going to look like that for the next 50 years. Like, we're going to see at our time on this earth, and we're still going to be looking at his Instagram going, Damn it. Well, a listener of ours did throw the theory that he's actually a vampire, which I would buy into. Mm, doesn't diminish his appeal at all. In but fact, this, quite the this opposite. perhaps started as Twilight fan fiction. All roads eventually lead back to Twilight for you. <laughs> all right, all right. So we obviously need to talk about MasterChef. Um, it wouldn't be a Tuesday edition if we didn't talk about MasterChef. And you didn't know this, but your favourite, your beloved jock is under fire. Yes. Why? Well, What's he doing? unfortunately said the, the sentence, Asian food can't be fine dining, like all Asian food. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and because Andy can't formulate an opinion on his own, he agreed. And yeah. um, uh, Melissa was, look, she was politely quiet on this issue. And I feel like I would love a little window into Melissa's inner dialogue when those two are speaking about food that is culturally hers, like Chinese food or because I just kind of watch her and, and you can just, I, I'm sure she's biting her perfectly formed tongue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. I mean, she's got to walk a tightrope on that show and she does do it very elegantly, but there would be times I'm sure she oh. must wake up at three o'clock in the morning and go, can I cannot believe it, Jesus, what the hell? I mean, I know that I wake up at 3 a.m. yelling, shut up, Andy. So I, I can only... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Khan left. Melissa did a beautiful cry. She cried. Oh, but you know what? That unfortunately, they put the, her crying in the promo. Obviously, not revealing who it was about. But yeah. as soon as I saw that, I knew it was Khan. We, and in fact, unfortunately, we are now 
detectives watching MasterChef because my husband Adrian is an editor and he's realised that if you look really closely at the interviews where they're narrating the show throughout, you you look at them and you go, okay, so these are filmed like after they've shot yeah. through the day mm. and if you look at them you think who out of these people looks like they've just been devastated. 100%. I look for the tears, yes. And Sarah Tiong was the most obvious one because she, her face was still sort of red from, from crying so it was mm. pretty obvious she was going. Mm. And Khan last night was pretty obvious because they didn't go to that interview very much. So I can only assume he was so upset yes. <laughs> that they didn't get much usable footage. But knowing that Melissa cried, I thought, she's not going to cry over Reynolds because nah. Reynolds is indestructible. He'll be fine no matter what. Yeah. But I just couldn't see Laura and Amelia triggering the tears, but Khan. Oh, yeah. yeah. 100%. Khan doing a hashtag gets get better speech. So it was so beautiful. Oh, I know. And he's got the UL Loved Tees, which uh, benefit Minus 18, which is a great group that helps youth LGBTQI. Um, so, I mean, he's, he's done all the right things and he seems to be a very kind person. So, but, you know, I just, I'm sorry. I'm not interested in your tears about going up against your friends. You're in the MasterChef kitchen. You want to be the winner. I don't want to hear about oh, doing the kick against my friends. It makes me so sad. Shut up. This is the Thunderdome, mate. I am the bride. You have to be prepared to eat each other. Exactly. Don't go into a competition. It is not, you know, it's not best friends MasterChef kitchen. It's the MasterChef kitchen. You want to have your own bloody fusion restaurant at the end of this. All right. No, you don't want to be hanging out with your mates. So it gives, gives me the shits when they all go, oh, I'm so sad to be, I'm so close with these guys. I'm like, shut up. But don't you think part of the appeal of it is that there is this sort of warm glow of them, of them, you know, that I feel, I feel, I like to believe, I hate it when I read anything that there's any tension in the MasterChef <laughs> kitchen. I want to believe that it's just this happy little commune. I know they nah. don't live together anymore, but I just see them there, Poe, wandering around, being all chaotic and no. I don't know. No, I'm I, not for it. This is why Reynolds going to win. Reynolds not crying. Reynolds doesn't have any pictures up with love hearts around him in his house. He's just got one thing scrawled in blood on the wall, win at all costs. <laughs> like for me, if you've seen Terminator 2, he is the T-1000 in chef form. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> I just think Reynolds wants it more. He's not getting emotionally involved with people and formerly homophobic Reynolds could take it out, which would be oh. a shame. But anyway. <laughs> Oh, uh, it would be a shame, but I think we know. I mean, what yeah. has he got up his sleeve what has he got? final cork? What has he got? Oh, my God. I did enjoy, before we move on from MasterChef, I did enjoy the combination of Callum and Poe. And if Callum said one more time, we have very different cooking styles. <laughs> 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 Such a polite way of saying she is utter chaos. I don't even know what's happening over there. She has no sense of time. She's throwing things in the air and then she's just sort of looking at a plant. She's just such a She's just so she's on her own plane, Poe. So Callum is just frantically, sweatily, Poe, we're gonna have to drop a dish, we're gonna have to drop a dish. She's like, no, we're gonna be fine. <laughs> well, he's trying to sh- slow cook a, a pork shoulder, which normally takes four days. And like, <laughs> she's just like Mm. Anyway, so um, look, hopefully Jock recovers from his fait pas. Yeah, and, my, uh, uh, yeah that, that's a bad one, unfortunately. That does chip away at my love. It's still strong, though. But you I know still, what? in all honesty, I wish that Jock could be The Bachelor in the next season if they could just <laughs> roll straight onto that. I know he's happily married. He's but imagine, named, yeah. I think it'd be really good. Also, the attitude that he brings in. I mean, obviously not when he's talking about Asian all food. sorts of cuisine around the world. No. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I wouldn't be adverse to as a twist? Hmm. Uh, Melissa and Jock um, sending Andy home from the MasterChef kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we've decided after today's cook, you're all very good. So today, <laughs> leaving us sadly, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Your campaign, I mean, it's escalating, Em. It's escalating. I feel like it's bubbled up throughout the season and I'm scared about where you're going to be at with Andy by the time. I feel like you're being radicalised by watching Andy. (laughs) Like last night he actually said something like, all right, so who do we think's doing great and who's not great? I was like, are you for real? And he, you know he's going to get his own bloody spin-off cooking show. Like this is going to happen. He's going to end up with a primetime deal. And I just, I'm not happy. <laughs> and I know a lot of our listeners now, I've, I've had quite a few messages saying, I can't help but hear you when every time Andy speaks. <laughs> you go, shut up, Andy. <laughs> and so does my husband at 3 a.m. At, that's not a joke. I did once sit up in the middle of the night yelling, shut up, Andy. <laughs> not a joke. 
<laughs> oh, I think you've spent a bit too long in the media with 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 blokey dudes who yep. perhaps haven't done all the preparation they needed no. to. No, they're just there because they're mildly attractive blokey dudes. Fine. It's fine. He's no jock, though, on the attractiveness <laughs> one for me. Anyway, sorry, I've got to move on. No, we do. And I really did. We, uh, there's been a lot, like, especially when I was on the project last week, there's a, obviously a lot going on at the moment. And we are re-examining things that in the past were okay and now are problematic. And it, there's a wide gamut of things. But one of the big topics has been problematic pop culture. And obviously in the last week, Gone with the Wind was removed from HBO. Is it HBO Plus or whatever their streaming? Max. Max. HBO Max, which isn't even available here yet. No. And it was temporarily to put a put a little well, sort of yeah. warning on the front. Obviously, if you haven't seen Gone with the Wind, it's problematic in many ways. But the main one being that it, it kind of depicts slavery as a fun, jolly situation that the African Americans in that movie enjoyed. Oh, yeah, they were they yeah, it was a beautiful homely situation. And yeah. I would say I did I watched that movie from a very young age. My grandmother really liked that movie. <laughs> of course, God. Of course. God. Of, course right. of course she did. And I I would say that I did sort of have str- a strange perception of the history of slavery in America, partially because of things like that and the cartoons that I used to watch. Yeah. Like I was just very, very confused about that and also about Native Americans as well. Like pop Mm. culture really delivered some very strange messages. I know. And, I mean, and also um, you and I had dinner Friday night and we were talking about that. That's a whole situation that America has tried to sweep under the rug, The how they treated Native American Indians and how they continue to treat Native American Indians. But, you know, speaking of Disney, don't have a great history with Native American Indians. But <laughs> oh, no. they have obviously on Disney Plus have got a back catalogue available, speaking of cartoons we watched growing up, and they now have um, put warnings saying that there is outdated cultural depictions. So we're talking about Dumbo. Obviously, you'll remember the Crows who <laughs> oh, their yeah. leader was called Jim Crow. Um, yeah. <laughs> Not great. Peter Pan, Lady in the Tramp, The Jungle Book, The Aristocrats have all got these warnings. And I think that's a bit bullshit because if a kid goes to watch this show on their own, they're not going to read a warning, a disclaimer. If if Disney is serious, I need a bunch of Disney, Disney princesses to appear with some of the Avengers and explain racial stereotypes and why they're bad. It needs to be interactive. For me, yeah. A little, a warning, like what 10-year-old kid's going to sit and read about outdated cultural depictions? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Warner Brothers got Whoopi Goldberg to put a warning in front of uh, Looney Tunes and she comes out and sort of explains it all in detail and even kids instantly recognise who she is. Mm. So, I mean, that's much more likely to cut through yeah. as opposed to just like a black screen with a yeah, with a I little, know. feels like a legal disclaimer at the front it of is. it. It is. It just feels like ass covering. Do you know what I mean? But then again, I mean, you know, they certainly, if they remove them, then those films get sort of fetishized. And because it's been interesting hearing about, there's a great podcast actually about mm. the, what happens with Song of the South. You know, Disney essentially banned that and it's ended up having this weird pirated, yeah. fetishized. Yeah kind of life. So the challenge does seem to be how do you put it in context? I mean the main thing is just make just make lots of new stuff that that exactly. like make your Moanas. <clears throat> make your you know mm. invest in films and stories. Like that's the way to do it. Words are nothing. It's putting your cash. So you know instead of spending four hundred million dollars on repurposing friends, you know, put that <laughs> oh, yes. put that into black indigenous and people of colours projects. But also like Oh, I, t- I don't know. <laughs> I get so upset about this. The statue's coming down. I mean, I mean, we can't rewrite history and that keeps getting trotted out. And you can't erase these films because for me, I think that they're like a history. They're like a spectrum for us to look at and go, okay, we were really wrong then. And I think it's, it's, we need to keep them there as a reminder and as, as a way to kind of plot the history of film and TV and social ideals. But with statues, so obviously there's a lot of controversy about Captain Cook's statue at the moment. One was defaced in Melbourne. And for me, I understand the idea of people wanting statues to come down because they're in public places, they're deliberately huge. Yeah, so if you've, if you've got it, 
in the yeah. middle of a big park. That's yeah. sort of like saying this is an aspect of our society that we celebrate. Exactly. Like, if it's in a museum, that's one thing. Fine. With a proper sort of context to yes. it. Yes. Yeah, and I think that idea could be to put all these statues in a museum. Do you know what I mean? In a place where there is a balanced the depiction of what happened. And But I just think, you know, these immovable reminders that are designed for us to look up to, that's why statues are made so tall. Mm. I just think... As, as if an Indigenous person, you would see that as like this, this idolization of people with terrible histories, and I and I just I understand the idea of removing the statues, but this did lead us to discuss movies that we loved, and I told you that there was one movie that I watched with my kids that I yeah. realized is not okay, and this wasn't on the racial spectrum so much as the treatment of women. Oh yeah, the Ghostbusters original. <sighs> Oh, oh my oh. god! I haven't watched it in years. I have okay, desperately thinking about it. I, I, I Sigourney Weaver's the the main Dana. Like the whole core of that movie revolves around sexual harassment. The whole what? like well, well, because um, Venkman, obviously Bill Murray's character, mm. um, has to be told no means no, and then someone asks him, "Why do you carry around three hundred cc's of thoraz- thorazine, which is a date rape, like a knockout drug?" <sighs> And yeah. then, like, all of them are kind of creepy towards her and in the end he ends up with her, like, uh, as though he wore her down in some way. They tie her to a chair. The whole – I was watching it going, this is an ode to sexual harassment and unwanted oh sexual harassment. He asks an elderly woman if she's menstruating. Like, the oh. whole <laughs> – I don't even have memories of these bits. I used to dress up as Ghostbusters as a child. I modeled myself. I loved them. And the whole 75% of the cast, obviously, middle-aged white men. Um, but it's just, it's not okay. And I was watching it with the girls because I watched that first and then we watched the remake of Ghostbusters, which we'll get to. And yeah. I just, through the whole film, was like, this is just like sexual harassment and potential date rape <laughs> and the whole film. And I just at the time remember watching it thinking, who are you going to cut? Like just loving the song and. Oh, yeah. What a what a banging title track. It's Incredible. Not, it's not okay. And oh. so, <laughs> no, it's just not okay. But, I mean, there's some other ones too. I, mean, the, I just want to say if you haven't watched the new Ghostbusters, it's amazing. All female cast. It, it, the only kind of weird sexual undertones, they're not even weird, is slight ogling of Chris Hemsworth. But it's just totally fine. But I loved it, and it got smashed online mainly All the by band boys. Yeah, couldn't yeah, hack it. couldn't hack it. But I highly recommend that movie if you haven't seen it, the new Ghostbusters. But also think about movies like Annie. Oh, what Annie? Okay, I haven't, I haven't given thought to that either. Can you what? remember Daddy Warbucks's magical bodyguard? Do you remember his <gasps> name? Punjab. <laughs> that no. name alone is oh. not okay. <laughs> and that actor, not even remotely Indian. Oh, no. Not okay. Oh. Breakfast at Tiffany's. Let's talk oh, about no, that. that, that uh, I know. I know. I know. Mickey Rooney. Oh, yeah. Even- well, well-known Japanese actor Mickey <laughs> Rooney <laughs> playing playing Mr. Uniyoshi next door to Holly. Yeah, that's not okay. And 16 Candles. I don't know whether oh. anyone remembers Long Duck Dong. No. I mean, Even Jesus the Goonies. Christ. Even the Goonies. Um, one of the characters, he was a tech nerd and also. Yeah, fun. it's played by the kid that played Short Round in Indiana Jones and the Temple yes. of Doom, which I'm also sure is oh. terrible if I think about it. These movies, see, see, you and I look back on them and cringe, which is why I think it's important for them to stay in place because we have learned. And I'm sure in another 20 years we're going to look back. I mean, 2004. Or there was a TV show called There's Something About Miriam in which the 21-year-old Mexican model was in charge of try- trying to woo, like it's like a bachelor thing, six men, and they didn't find out she was a transgendered woman until the final episode. And the kicker being hopefully the producers could film that, you know, they were a disgusted response to a transgendered oh, woman, which was God. so problematic on so, so many levels. I mean, it really is representation of trans people but oh. in our life time has been I mean Horrific. friends friends oh, friends with Kathleen Turner playing Chandler's oh. father who oh. transitioned oh my god disaster yeah. and also like my first sort of impression of of a trans person was Silence of the Lambs oh. where it's yeah, remember Silence of the Lambs? It was completely conflated with, you know, he he felt like he was in the wrong body, so we wanted to create 
uh, oh, he, yes. the serial killer was completely trying to like create a woman's body. And so they were 100% drawing a link oh, no. between their trans identity and them being killer. So there's some, some aspects of things that we grew up with that I just don't even understand how it happened. And wildly so, every children's franchise, why was there always a thing where there would be like one girl and a bazillion guys? And like across across so many different things, like Wizard obviously of Ghostbusters. Yeah, but at least she was the lead. And, and, and obviously mm. there were Disney films, but and there were terrible representations of princesses, but they were pleased. But then you ended up in this scenario with like Sesame Street. <laughs> why, why were all of the creatures on Sesame Street. Where were the women? Oh Mama my God, had Miss Piggy. That's it. I know, but she, she at least was fabulous. And like George Lucas imagines Star Wars and he's imagining this intergalactic universe, but he only really puts one woman in there. Why? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. And the most mysterious one to me was always the Smurfs. Oh my God, yes. Smurfette. Oh. Right. But also, I mean, the, uh, apart from just why wouldn't you have female characters? Even if they are, and I do remember Smurfette being very, very, I mean, she was she obsessed with her pink. own reflection and, and yeah, and yeah. brushing her hair and everything like that. But also just, just on a biological level, what is the situ with Smurfette and the Smurfs? Like there's one woman. How do they? How do they issue the produce? mother of them all? Yeah, where do they come from? I feel like that we need well, a Smurf I, origin story. But is well, it a weird like Holt where she's like the sex queen? Is apparently. I've I've looked online because <laughs> yeah I mean I went to Smurf sex straight away 100% and unfortunately because it's hard not to think is this a Smurf gangbang situation yeah <laughs> okay you just named the episode fantastic Smurf <laughs> gangbang and then I read one thing that said they're all the children of Papa Smurf and he had like a hundred sons and one daughter but then I read another thing that said Gargamel created Smurfette to distract and corrupt the Smurf so even that in itself oh, is a terrible gosh. situation. <laughs> Send in the woman and they won't be able to oh. they won't be able to control themselves anymore. Oh god. Nah, good. So basically we're there's we're all doomed. Um and I think that this is a great illustration why we shouldn't look too hard um to <laughs> the makers of TV and movie for um I mean, I guess it's an excellent window into where we are culturally and hopefully moving forward. I mean, I feel like is there going to be like a, a segment on, a, you know, a section on Netflix now where it's like ethnically problematic movies you may enjoy? Like is that what, <laughs> what's going to happen? Oh, God. <laughs> ethically, not ethnically. Ethically problematic movies you may enjoy. Here's, here's some suggestions. Is that what's going to happen? I think it's just it's just let's put our energy into spotlighting the the newer storytelling that, that that's getting it right. Because I do remember one time in the moment being knocked around by something that I saw and it was a Friends episode. I've never and- liked Friends. I just want to put it out there. <laughs> never never week, been a fan of it. This week the um, the head writer of Friends has sort of come out and, and, and she actually spoke really brilliantly about it and said that she was, you know, semi-consciously kind of a part of, definitely a part of systematic, yes. systemic racism. But uh, also there there was just this one episode that I remember and, it, and the premise of the episode was that Ross and Chandler, they accidentally fell asleep on each other in like like oh, on yeah. the couch and yeah. and they had this really, really restful sleep and they realised that they loved sleeping, mm. sort of touching each other. Mm. And so they continue to do it illicitly and the whole episode just builds up to them being exposed to the, to the rest of the gang. And so yeah. it's all like built on gay panic and then finally at the climax, that's the punchline, that they come in and they see them sleeping soundly, you know, naked or anything, just like sleeping yeah, as though they're something to be embarrassed about. Yeah, and all of the, the other four friends are just recoil and look in horror. And I do remember watching that and thinking because they were you know you were encouraged to sort of identify with those characters and to sort of feel like they were your friends too and and to imagine that just even notion of a man touching a man is that horrific was as bad and that show is still so popular well yeah gen z are really they're hard into watching friends listen if you're a friends fan still you really need to next time you watch examine the amount of ethnic diversity involved with that show <laughs> or lack thereof um yeah no look yeah I, I, the only character i ever remotely identified with when if it was on in the background was phoebe i think that speaks volumes for me oh lisa kudrow i mean yeah. still today magnificent. the only one all right well gosh we went some places good on us oh, we went from did. jock to smurf gangbangs fantastic <laughs> <laughs> wonder if i'm allowed to call the episode that we something like that 
Just know I wanted to call it that if that's not what it's called. Just have to walk a careful line with Jock because obviously in my mind I still want to meet him one day in real life and I can't, I can't no, have fine. anything too compromising. We'll be friends. It was okay. He's fine. It's not Andy. So whatever. It could be worse. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, people have been asking me, are five bedrooms going to include coronavirus in season three? Season, yeah. So we are in the middle of doing season two. We go back this week. Yes. Which is so yes. exciting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so season two it won't. So the one that will come on air this year won't because we'd no. already – we're yeah, like sure midway it. through shooting the episode, so we yeah. can't really do it. But but at this point, <gasps> oh, actually, I haven't rung it by Channel Ten. But at this point, yeah, we are gonna. Um, we want to kick off season three with sort of a little what happened to them during the pandemic storyline. So we have heeded, we have heeded the advice of the listeners. Having said that, it could still be rejected by the network. No, are we, I don't think it will do be. It? And I, I will use the stats to back it up. Yeah, we had it. I get, it was unanimous almost. But uh, are you talking like a pandemic montage? Like, are you just going to... Well, wanted- we've got... We use voiceover in the show and often... Uh, not a montage. No, no, no. A mon- we, we'll do a lockdown episode, basically. But we, we think it would be... We, we've gone back and forth about it. And we felt like by the time season three comes along, you're not, you're not going to watch a whole series that was set in lockdown. But Yeah, and not only that, even just watching the MasterChef contestants do elbow high fives, you're allowed to do real high fives again now. So it feels like out of touch. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I, yeah, feel yeah. Like, I feel like you want to you want to acknowledge it. And especially in a show that's about people hunkered down living with each other. You, you, there's <laughs> story opportunities there and weird yeah. shit happened in lockdown for yeah. all of us weird shit did happen so we are going to go there thank you thank you emsolators all right oh great Woo-hoo! talk to you later in the week okay bye this is emsolation all right well it's uh tuesday today it's actually this is super confusing because we record on mondays it comes out on tuesday but i know a lot of you don't listen to them some of you save us up try to listen to us the second it comes out 601 Straight away. <laughs> uh, it's time for Scotty Barrow to help one of you guys out. Hello, husband. Hello. It's been a long session today for you. It has. Michael and I went quite long, but that's okay. Yeah, I wasn't saying it wasn't okay. <laughs> There's a little window into our dynamic. Uh, okay, let's get straight into it. Great Great problem slash issue slash, oh, I don't know, thing sent in from Deb in Sydney. Have a listen. Hey, Scotty and Em. My name's Deb. I'm 44 and I'm from Sydney. I just finished listening to your Soggy Broccoli podcast and I could really relate to the conversation, Scotty, you were having about being um, emotionally impatient at times with Em. My partner and I are in a very similar uh, situation in that she tends to be the uh, emotional one and I tend to be the uh, at t- oftentimes hyper-rational one. And I was just wondering if you had any tips or advice about how to really work work on your emotional impatience because I do find it is a bit of a stumbling block at times for our relationship. Thank you so much and appreciate your thoughts. All right. So obviously, Scotty, it struck a chord with her listening to us and then it struck a chord with me listening to Deb having her chord struck by us. (laughs) Thank you you for that inception (laughs) sentence. So, if you haven't figured out and long-time uh, listeners and members of my community know that Scott is hyper-rational and when things bounce onto Scott, they bounce into his brain first. When th- things bounce onto me, they hit my heart first, then my gut. Lastly, they visit my brain. My brain is probably the last organ involved in things when it hits my body. <laughs> I'll hand it over to you, Scotty, now, but this is very interesting and I wonder, I mean, I'm, this dynamic in relationships and part of the reason I was attracted to you because you are so um, rational and sensible. Part of the reason that you piss me off now 20 years down the track is that you're so rational and calm, or not even calm, just you, you function at a different frequency to me. So if you're in a situation like Debbie's and like Em and Scott are, how do you function together? Yeah, I reckon um, I'd like to start with three little teachings, if you like, just to sort of um, provide a bit of scope. So He's taken the mic. He's sat back and he's like, just let me take this down. And I'm happy to. I'm going to have my coffee that you got me. Start with your three teachings. (sighs) (laughs) Take a breath. All is not all as it feels. And just know I abused him this morning for making pasta with onion in it because I'm allergic to onion. He bought the wrong coffee home. He left the kitchen a mess and I did my nani and he was so calm. He went out and he got me good food, the correct coffee. We've been through a lot already today. <laughs> Go. So 
emotional impatience. Well, I love this definition. I got this little definition that came across my uh, awareness a while ago, and it was from David G. Allen. I don't know who that is, and I haven't even looked at who it is, but here, this is what this person says. Patience is the calm acceptance that things can happen in a different order than the one you have in mind. So I'm a very patient person, even though I'm super impatient because I live for things happening at any time. But there's no calm acceptance. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, keep going. All right. Now, the second thing is emotions. Now, often people refer to emotions as um, when we're extreme emotions. And when they're looking to solve problems, it's always – emotions is almost like, oh, I've just got to not be emotional – which is sort of understandable, but in reality, we're in emotion in every moment. Every moment of our existence, right now, you, me, everyone listening, we're in emotion. So the key then is not to go, oh, emotions are bad, because you should have shut down that whole aspect of your intelligence and way of being, more to recognize what is the emotion I'm experiencing right now at various times, and then how do I cultivate, uh, actively cultivate the emotions that work and help me? All right, so that's one other thing. Now, the last thing is from an ontological coaching perspective and learning perspective, which is ontology is just a study of what it is to be human. So these, um, this research and this perspective is cross-cultural. Um, it's cross-nations, cross-language. These are the patterns that exist in all humans pretty much. So in dialogue, they say there's three conversations happening. So when you and I are talking, for instance, right now, there's three conversations. There's the public conversation you and me are having that we can hear, that everyone else can hear. And then there's the conversation that's happening in your head. And there's a conversation that's happening in my head. And now Emmy is going to act on the co- on the private conversation that's happening in her head. I would say a man came up with that theory that there's only three conversations because in my head there's about ten conversations going on. So there's the public one between me and you, and perhaps you're have only got one internal, but me, I've got so many internals. So while I'm sitting here with you, I'm also thinking about making sure someone's going to pick up OD at 3.45, making sure that I get this deadline I'm on with my writing done, just thinking about what Elio's eaten today, just making sure my teller gets a uni assignment done. I've got all those conversations happening as well, which is the mental load that a lot of women carry. So when we go into these conversations where someone's hyper-rational and someone is emotional, Do you think the hyper-rational person forgets that the emotional person's probably got 9,000 other things going on in their head and that colours their conversation? Yes. Yeah, there's some some truth in that. Um, Yes, of course, you might have multiple things going on in your head, but we're going to group that as under the private conversation. For the simplicity and clarity of this model, thank you very much. (laughs) Okay, will we get to the end of this? That was an excellent example of me being. Yes, no, you're right. Sometimes I think I feel like a sail flapping in the breeze, a sequined rainbow sail, and the ends are just fraying and I've got nothing to tie it down to. Sometimes it's like, you know, in Moana where the island is leaking darkness into the river, into the sea, that's how my brain feels sometimes. Whereas I think your brain's kind of like just like a black and white steel trap. (laughs) And I love the fact that you're so confident about what you know that's inside my brain. I like that. 20 years, mate. People get less for life. <laughs> I mean, right. for murder. People get less for murder. <laughs> okay. Can we get back to helping Deb? Can you imagine you and I trying to do a school project together? Oh, my God. <laughs> that would be exciting. <laughs> Can we get back? To- yes. Oh, all right. Deb. Okay. So the definition of patience, a calm acceptance Stop that our- things can happen out of order. Uh, the fact that we're in emotion all the time, mm-hmm. so just get good at them. Don't it's not good and bad and, and yes or no or, or get rid of them or get good of them by awareness and then actively choosing your emotions. And the third thing is that idea of three overall conversations. There's a public one and then there's the two private ones between the two people. Now, some ways to be better. So with your you and your partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Overall, overall ways to be better. Overall, who do I want to be as a person? What sort of qualities do I want to have and live by and live with? And then secondly, no, not yet. And secondly, and therefore, how do I want to be in this relationships, especially in crunch times? Mm -hmm. I would argue with you that I can't choose my emotions. 
You've said that as a hyper rational person. And if you say to a person who leads with their emotions, choose your emotion. You're choosing to be very upset by this. I would say to you, I'm completely controlled by my, my emotions and my emotions pick me. That's what I would say to you. Okay. And a lot of hyper emotional people, not even hyper, it's just the, the language I'm using, people who are like me <laughs> would be would feel very misread and ripped off by someone saying to them, you're choosing to be pissed off right now because honestly, Scott, a lot of the time I, I watch myself from afar overreacting to stuff or, or, or feeling things and like going, God, I can't, this horse has broken. It's gone and I can't get it back. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. And for me, the way I would understand that to still stay by what I've said, but mm. apply it where, where it feels right for you, is that um, that emotional horse r- rides its own race, and and it's not until the horse, the wild horse, really sort of calms down that you can get it back in the stable, and that's when you're sort of got that ability to have more choice, more awareness. But whose responsibility is it in these exchanges? Say, if the hyper rational partner and the emotional partner are having a tough time communicating, it kind of feels like you're putting it on the emotional person to keep in check. Like whose responsibility is it in this situation? Because it sounds to me like you're putting it on the person who's having the most problems with it. Do you know what I mean? No, uh, the responsibility is for you to take responsibility for yourself and me to take the responsibility of myself. But if you're a hyper-rational person and you know that you're married to someone who's going to react in a certain way, isn't it your responsibility to kind of work it better? Yeah, I think that happens from both directions. Both people have to make an equal effort to because you've got what you need and then you've got to recognise what you need to give in the communication and vice versa. So there's four sort of strands of communication, two from you, two from me. Okay. Um, so who do I want to be mm-hmm. and how do I want to be in this relationship in crunch times, all right? So now the specifics of the situations, things that you can do, that was what, that was what essentially Deb was asking, Um I'm going to quickly list them and then we'll break them down. Assess, identify, relate and hold the space and then learn later. Go right. slower. Okay. First of all, assessing, all right? Assess, yep. identify, mm-hmm. relate and hold the space mm-hmm. and learn later. Mm-hmm. So assessing is about recognising the situation. So when your partner's upset or whatever, efficiently identify the situation via your partner's mood or state mm-hmm. and also what they're talking about. Quickly, okay, this is a situation where my wife, Amelia, is really upset and frustrated or confused or angry or all those things. Okay, that's what it is, all right? Then straight away as well, you are, you're, you've got to assess yourself and scan yourself. So you're noticing what's going on in your own thoughts, where your attention is, what you've been thinking about, how you're interpreting what's happening in front of you. You're noticing your own emotional state. Oh, God, I feel like I'm edgy because where's this going to go? Or, or okay, I want to quickly solve it so I'm not uncomfortable. Yes, absolutely, exactly. And the solving for me, I'm not going to talk for other people, but for me the solving is a way of me avoiding the emotional discomfort that I'm not aware of that's happening because of this exchange between you. That's what happens for me. I'm not saying that's what happens for everyone. And then, of course, your body. How am I feeling in my body? Right now I'm feeling a bit sort of actually right now as I'm speaking, I'm feeling a bit edgy and it's like half excitement, half anxiety. Are you feeling anxiety and me constantly jumping in and derailing you? Partly, yes, but also that I'm trying to relax into that and say that's okay as well. So this is what's – I'm not bullshitting right now. This is actually what's happening. Yeah, so that's pretty much our marriage. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's the assessing. Assessing them, your partner or the person you're speaking to, how are they, what's their state like, what, what are they talking about? Mm-hmm. And then yourself, how, where am I? Am I right to go? What, what, how do I need to be to be my best right now? And then identify, again, who do I want to be here right now? Who do I want to be? And that's where you not need to think about it beforehand so that you can reference it quickly. Okay, I want to be kind. I want to be caring. I want to be supportive. Oh, wow. I thought you meant like I, I want to be Dolly Parton and still Magnolias. Yes, that's funny. But also I'm if not you – I'm trying to be funny. That's who like whenever I think about arguments, she's very good at defusing but also getting to the heart of things. Yes. So if that's what you think is a really helpful reference for you to be in that conversation, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's like a label for that way of being. Love it. Yeah. So who do I want to be here? And then what do I need to do? So if I'm picking up that you are really upset and distressed or whatever or confused or angry or all that, really, what do I need to do? First of all, I've got to be there with you, present, available, and just be there in it with you, yeah. supporting you. Yeah, which 
I want to point out it's hard because in the moment you're usually going from I am zero to 100 bypassing my brain wanting to just punch Scott really hard. But it's not always your, your challenges aren't always about me. They're no. Like other things, which that's why I stuff those ones up more probably. No, you don't stuff up. A lot of my challenges are to do with you purely because we've been in lockdown for the last six months on top of each other. So a lot of people listening now, their relationships all of a sudden have gone from maybe third or fourth on their list to one because you're both in each other's faces. You're like, oh, my God, all my problems are my partner because you're spending way more time together than you should. So when Scott tells you these things and he admits that he hasn't perfected it and it's really hard to do and both of us fail at this all the time. So, yeah, these are just, I mean, serving suggestions. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm... I am not. There's billions of people better than this than I am, but I am constantly practicing it. Yeah. And also, I, I use, um, there's no judgment in the work I do, but I'm certainly using this mindful uh, approach about how I need to serve my clients too. Yeah. So There's plenty of judgment in the work I do. just want to point that out. Okay, wrap up. I'm not wrapping up. So – We've assessed, we've identified who we want to be. Then we got to, then it's about what's happening in the conversation, the relating and the holding the space. So one, so listening, listening through that filter of kindness, care, support, or whatever the, your identity is, like uh, Dolly Parton. Okay. And when we're listening to someone who's emotional and you think, and in your head you're going, why don't they just buddy do this? Or you should do this. Or even if it's kind and patient, you should, well, have you thought about this? No, they're not interested in you helping them solve their problem yet. They need to be heard to get the clarity that they need. So you've got to respect their unique problem solving approach and ability and capacity to solve their own problems first. Because if they couldn't solve their problems and they wanted your help, they would f-ing ask, wouldn't they, Emmy? I language. <laughs> All right, but that that yes. that needs yes. to come in for challenging at times. At times. yes, I, I, sometimes I have to say to you, please listen, don't solve. Sometimes you have to do that if you're with a hyper rational person, like an emotional oh, robot. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, and we'll ca- carry on. <laughs> you need to say, "Hey, babe, I just need to like dump on you at the moment. Can you just listen, not solve?" And all I want to hear is. Oh, that's really that's I'm sorry that happened to you. That must be really shit. Is there anything I can do to help? They are three sentences that take me from one hundred back down to calm so quickly. But you have to mean it when you say those things and you have to embody it. I can't just trot them out and you know. But you can. <laughs> okay, I can too. That's excellent for me. All right, great. I can pretend my way through it. Fantastic. Okay, so you're listening through that filter of what you think's um the best version for you to help your partner. Yeah. I've got kindness, care, support. Then you want to empathise, as you've just said. So that's about suspending any judgement and ramp up your feelings of understanding and connection to their exact feelings. Don't go, don't judge them from the outside. Get inside their feelings and, and go, what would that be like if I was experienced that exact stuff? Then, of course, you always want to be observing your body and emotions during the conversations as it's, as it's happening because that's your early warning system against you going back into your own head and listening to your own commentary or destructive speaking, which is almost one version it could be an impatient, oh, come on, I'm sick of this, or another one would be, oh, why don't you try this, giving advice before they've even asked it or even moving them into problem solving before they're ready. All right. So uh, your body and your emotions are your early warning systems that you might be starting to think about your own stuff rather than listening to them mm-hmm. and say say things that's not going to help. Mm-hmm. All right. And then also in your body, you want to embody how how you want to be. So how how am I sitting? How do I want to sit as I'm listening to this person? How do I want to stand? What am I? What's my posture? What's my positioning? What's my orientation? That's important. Amy's leaning to me right now. Like, say, for instance, you don't want your partner to be staring blankly off into space, rolling their eyes every 30 seconds. No. Hot shot! It's not every 30 seconds, it's every 37 seconds. Sometimes when I'm, like, ranting, Scott just goes onto another plane and he'll just sit there and he's just, honestly, he looks like someone's removed his brain for a minute and it's just the, the dishevelled body of a broken man sitting there while I rant and the eye rolling draws me crazy! But the eye rolling, we have a culture of family, culture of eye rolling. Because everyone's trying to impart their own will on everyone else in this family yeah. in a caring and also impatient way. Okay. Now, the next thing you want to be doing is only speak, so-called speak when you're asked or only think when you're asked. So don't come in. Your speaking might be like you said, it's empathetic. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry that's happening to you. That feels terrible. Is there anything I can do? So you're just tapping around the edges. It's a gentle thing rather than coming in with your best ideas because I don't want them yet. 
all right? And then, of course, offer your availability. Is there anything I can do to help when the moment wants it, Mm -hmm. when the moment wants it, all right? Now, the other thing is if you're trying to help your partner and be kind and listen to them and do all those great things, if also you are feeling flooded or overwhelmed or you're losing it a bit, losing your patience, then or and essentially you're not being of service, then you can ask for a time out. You can ask for a time out. Obviously, that will be within the context of your relationship. You're not going to ask for a time out when they're full, all guns blazing because they might need to maintain that momentum, but it, could, it can help and it also can help them, all right? So that's that. Mm. Now, the fourth step is learning later and that's where you got to reflect on how did I do, how did it feel and how, do I, how did it seem to help or not? the way I do went about it, and finally contrast that to their feedback. How did I, how did I go? Um, how could I help you better next time? All right? So. In summary. In summary, see, this is now my wife is actually becoming emotionally impatient right now. <laughs> and now I have to breathe through it. <clears throat> okay. So in summary, in summary. Did you hear my class? Yes, that's, that means we've won the game. We've clocked the game. My, my producer, Mike, listens in while we do this. <laughs> yeah, we need to pay him to do that more. All right. Tell me, don't. I'm joking. I'll make the jokes, mate. Get in there. Of course. Yes, dear. So in summary, you're there to serve them, not yourself. Remember who you want to be, Dolly Parton or whatever, you know, qualities that you want, and be self-aware in those moments. Mm-hmm. And lastly, practice it. Play with it because it's not going to happen automatically. So there'll be some stuff you need to do ahead of time in, you know, preparation and consideration, and then there'll be in the moments you'll just need to um, hopefully be aware enough to remember, okay, that's how I want to be, and then it's it's being there for them. Thanks, mate. You did really well. I threw everything at you. You were Indiana Jones. You were Donkey Kong. You are Donkey Kong jumping barrels. Uh, if you want to learn more about my husband, he has a website, scottbarrow.com.au, um, and also he's on Instagram at scottbarrowcoach. And if you'd like help, this was our longest one. God, you, I really threw it at you. I kind of feel like it could be a good one. Do you? Yeah. Oh, Do you feel like that? I don't know. I feel a bit like right now within myself, if I'm being honest. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I feel what like. Do you feel like? Nah, I feel fine. Thanks, guys. Hello at mrossiano.com. If you have some things you'd like Scotty B to help you with, he'll be back next week. And that's it for M Salation this week. It's a bumper edition. It's probably going to be nearly an hour. Michael and I went for ages as well. Uh, thank you very much. As always, don't forget, if you want to come to my Live in Your Lounge Room show, it's going to be 10 bucks, and all the info will be at mrossiano.com in a couple of days. And um, that's it. That's all for now. We'll chat to you guys on Thursday. Bye. How are you lost, baby girl?